Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, if y'all don't know Lindsay Brewell, who's visiting with us today, Lindsay uh, and her family are members here, and Lindsay's a seminary student over at Perkins and um, is doing an internship here this semester. What's the area of that internship? So it's a sort of general internship. Yes. Okay, great. And she's got two wonderful kids who uh, are active in the church and her husband, uh, Jake. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, hello to everyone. Good to see y'all and uh, everyone who is joining us electronically uh, now or in the future. <laughs> we do have people who watch throughout the week. Uh, so it's sort of an interesting thing. Um, one little um, scheduling announcement um, so that you can be sure and be here next week when something better is happening. Uh, I'm going to be gone speaking at a church in Fort Worth next Sunday, uh, but Jim Hancock is going to be teaching for us, and uh, Jim Pike is going to handle doing the live streaming. Because I will also be out of town. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be fine. <laughs> going to be fine. Um, okay. Well, I hope, hope everyone's well. Um, I got my COVID booster shot on Thursday. And I, I wrote Friday, if you, if you follow my Friday roundup through B&G, I, I was really conflicted about it. Because, you know, I just wish my shot could go to someone in another part of the world who doesn't have a shot at all. Um, but apparently it doesn't work that way. Uh, and that's a whole other issue of systemic uh, injustice. But that's not our lesson today. <laughs> Pardon? This is just my, my booster. Yeah, it's my booster. Yeah. Pfizer. Did you have Pfizer before? Did it make you sick? So, um, what it, what's done is it's it's mainly I'm I'm having a lot more congestion again. Uh, so it was Thursday, today, Sunday, and so the the cough that I had almost gotten rid of um, is sort of coming back. I hope it's temporary, um, but I think that just sort of set off all that. I was really fatigued on Friday, um, but not as bad as the first time. So, yeah. If you had Moderna, you can't get a booster yet, right? Yeah, it's too soon for Moderna. Okay. It's just the Pfizer. But I got my first shot in February. So uh, it, you have to, it also has to be six months. Joni? I got my Moderna in January. Oh, you can't? Okay. They have it okay. Oh, they're not authorized the booster yeah. for Moderna yet. They will eventually. Right. Yeah, I got mine in January. Yeah. Uh, we're, by the way, we're up to... Um, 80% of eligible Americans who either are vaccinated or say they're going to get vaccinated. Really? Uh, that's the latest uh, Gallup poll <coughs> that just came out this week on this, and it matches uh, CDC numbers, say, among those ages 12 and older, uh, we're at 76% with at least one shot in them. Uh, now, that varies widely by location because there are parts uh, of... Uh, rural Texas, for example, and West Texas, they're still in the 30 and 40% range. Um, so it's, it's really, a, a disp speaking of disparity, but that's <clears throat> not because of inequity, it's because of choice. And that's a different thing. Um, you know what the percentage is for Texas overall? Or I did not look lately. Before, it was, it was pushing 70%, so it's probably better than that, because there's been a lot of folks who've come through since the mandates have come in. Um, yeah, since the mandates have come in. So, uh, more crazy times for us, yep. right? Um, go figure. Okay, well this is your in for a treat today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the rapture some more. <laughs> I know that you're, you never grow weary of this. Um, <clears throat> So we're in first. Uh, we're working our way through First Thessalonians, verse by verse, 
And uh, we're at, we, we started last week uh, at the beginning of chapter five. No, we were, I'm sorry, chapter four. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And we made it all the way through verse eight, I believe. And we're supposed to pick up today in verse nine um, from here. And there's two, <clears throat> pardon me, there's two themes that we're going to try to attack today. Uh, but let's take them one at a time. So we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. And again, I'm reading a loose uh, interlinear kind of translation here so we can get at the um, some of these words. Um, now, he says, concerning brotherly love, and by the way, uh, the word, the Greek word used here is a word you're going to know, Philadelphia. This is not agape, this is not eros, this is Philadelphia. This is brotherly love, right? Now, concerning the brotherly love, there is no need uh, for me to write to you about this because you yourselves uh, have been taught by God. Uh, in other words, you have learned uh, in order to love, and this time it's agape, Okay, I could give you the whole sermon on three kinds of love in Greek, but you've already heard that 500 times because you've been in a Baptist church, right? Uh, to love one another, um, and you are doing this toward all the brothers. Uh, so interesting cognate here because the word brothers is Adelphus, which if you think about Philadelphia, right, it's the second half of that word, Right? Uh, for all, and, and this really should be read in an inclusive way, uh, it gets translated to us as brothers, for all the ones in all of Macedonia, remember that Thessalonica is part of the region known as Macedonia, and so when uh, the Macedonian call came, the result of that was being in Thessalonica as one part of that, right? However, we exhort you to abound more and more. Here's Paul always egging us on to do more than we're already doing. I get worn out with Paul on this because it's never enough. It's wearisome, but he wants us to do more and more of this and to strive earnestly to live quietly and to attend to your own work with your own hands just as we commanded you <clears throat> so that you may walk, and here's the word we talked about last week, uh, to walk again, so that you may walk properly toward those outside, meaning outside of us, and that no one may have need. <clears throat> so this is another, and this is one of several Pauline passages about brotherly, sisterly love and caring for one another and so forth. Uh, and what he's saying to the church, uh, to the Thessalonians is, look, you've already got this down. Just keep doing it and do more of it. This, this is not like the uh, Revelation letters to the churches that are, you know, doing all the bad stuff. This, this is a commendation that he's doing here, right? Uh, but again, he wants them to keep loving more and more. And here's where we get into some trouble with this passage and others like it. And I want to explain to you uh, the justification I sometimes hear for why we don't have to extend brotherly love to people outside the church. Okay, so the idea that, I, it, it, honest, I'm not making this up. This is God's honest truth. The way some people read this and understand it is, yes, we are to care for people in the church with us, that does not mean we have to care for people who are our neighbors outside the church. Therefore, I'm not going to vote for social programs. I'm not going to do anything to help people outside the church. It is a very insular way of looking at the world uh, that creates your own worldview oriented around, yes, I'm going to love my neighbor, but the neighbor I've got to love is only inside the church inside the Christian community. Now, we can see some problems with this, <laughs> right? Uh, honestly, this is one of the reasons 
some of these uh, John MacArthur's of the world, uh, these Calvinist, uh, misogynistic, how, how many adjectives can I put on this, um, old school um, pastors, uh, always white, always old. Well, no, there's some younger ones now. I'll take that back. This is one of the reasons they gave during the height of the COVID restrictions about why they were not going to obey the, um, the mandates to not gather in person. Because the only thing that mattered was taking care of their church. They had no responsibility under God to be a neighbor to people outside the church. This is the reasoning that was given. Now, the irony is that eventually this caught up with John MacArthur because they, they had a huge outbreak of COVID at his church, including him. And he was out for like three weeks. But he hid it and wouldn't admit it for months. It only came out recently that at the end of December, he had caught COVID at a staff Christmas party. So even that took a toll on the internal group that they were trying to protect. But once again, I think we have to stop and ask the question, okay, if that's your interpretation of this, how does that square with the teaching and life of Jesus? It's the exact opposite of what Jesus did. Because Jesus was the one out having dinner with outcasts, bringing Zacchaeus down from the tree, talking to the woman at the well, uh, just go on down the list, healing people who were outside the purview of the temple, uh, the synagogue. Jesus is the one who was accused of all these things. So we cannot read Paul apart from Jesus. And too many people want to take Paul in isolation from the Gospels. You've heard me on a rant before about preachers and teachers who only teach the Gospels and those who only preach Paul, and you got to have them both together to get the full picture. But ultimately, we give deference to the teachings of Jesus over the teachings of Paul. Now, because Paul is not divine. Jesus is divine. Paul is human. And yes, the Bible is inspired for us, but that does not elevate the teachings of Paul above the teachings of Jesus. And here's a great example of that. Has anyone else run into this, or is it just me who keeps encountering people who don't want to love their neighbor outside the church? Is that a foreign idea to you? Jim says no. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, so if that kind of religion, by the way, makes you a sect, that kind of religion makes you um, a, a club. It, it, it's a country club kind of view of religion uh, that makes it all about who's inside versus who's outside. And that doesn't fare so well in the long term. In my experience. Mark, yeah. Can you read that sentence again since I don't have my Bible up? What do you did, which one are you referring to? Uh, so um, well there's there's several, uh, but in verse ten, um, <clears throat> for you are doing this toward all the brothers, uh, you're loving them, uh, throughout Macedonia, and we exhort you to love them, these brothers, more and more. So uh, the idea that some people would take this and say, well, this is only referring to, the, to other Christians. We only have to love other Christians. I don't have to love someone outside the Christian fellowship. Now, the most narrow view of that that you don't see is so much as I only love people inside my own little church. Um, but the idea is we only care for those. Now, the other thing, this is, if you do that, you have something in common with Mormonism by the way, because the way the Mormon care and concern works, uh, if you live in a Mormon community, say in Utah or Idaho in particular, uh, and I've, I have talked to people who live in these communities who are Baptist, who get no help from the e expansive uh, social concern that the LDS church has that is always focused first and foremost on other Mormons. Don't be like that. <laughs> Caroline? I was going to say, though, that's sort of contrary to what they do, you know, in the 
that they send out missionaries two by two to go to the people that don't know them. Well, to convert you to their faith. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about conversion. church if you're not a member right i went once because in san diego the church had not opened yet oh to the yeah. temple right it had not opened yet and we got to yeah 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 like a tour. so there is this very exclusive view of this um and that's not what christianity is about hmm. right um i think it, it, anytime you find someone who is only concerned about people inside the church uh that is the antithesis of the very witness of Jesus to us. Well, okay, then what's devil's advocate here? Yes. So what's the difference? You can look at Jesus going out and healing and, you know, reaching out to those as being evangelism, as being going out and getting, reaching these people. Yeah. And bring them into the church. Well, as opposed to just doing good for all people. Yeah, so Jim, Jim's saying that you could, you could look at Jesus and see him as sort of doing this as an evangelistic thing. The problem is there was no church then. True. Uh, there was no church to bring them into. So if you want to call that evangelism, it's definitely social evangelism, and it's definitely social ministry. Uh, everything Jesus uh, is doing is caring for the needs of people because he's demonstrating the coming kingdom of God that brings wholeness to people, right? Uh, back many years ago, uh, when I had a little bit of hair on my head and worked for the Southern Baptist Home Mission Board, it was during this time that the, the conservative takeover of the convention was going on, and the Home Mission Board was in the center of this, uh, and I was there right at the hinge time, uh, I described my job as the best possible job under the worst possible circumstances. Uh, I was there three years at the Atlanta office, and we reorganized the staff three times in three years. It was perpetual chaos during this time. But part of what was going on was the Home Mission Board had been known for years as the social ministry arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, there was a huge department division uh, within the Home Mission Board that ran social ministry centers and supported them all over the country uh, in association with churches and associations and state conventions, right? Uh, and what was happening at that time as part of this fundamentalist takeover was in order to do social ministry, you had to justify it as being evangelistic. And so uh, the, the hinge people who were in, in charge at that point got on board with social ministry, like food banks and clothing closets and soup kitchens and those types of things, as long as you could evangelize people and you could show on a report that you made converts. As long as the social ministry was a means to the end of evangelism, it was okay. But that was only a step along the way because what happened next was you got down to pure evangelism because they, they ultimately shut out the funding and the support for all the social ministry because they just wanted to do evangelism. And so there is this missed idea. Again, what's Jesus doing? Jesus is caring for the needs of people whether they come into the church or not. Jesus is healing people whether they convert to his way of thinking or not. Find me an example in the Gospels where Jesus requires someone to believe in order for him to heal them. No. Belief follows healing, but we, most of these people, we don't know what happened to them, which is interesting because if it was all about the evangelistic effort, you think the Gospel writers would have kept a tally. <laughs> They weren't good Baptists. <laughs> their yeah, their record-keeping system lacked. <laughs> you see the problem? Questions, comments on this? Isn't there a place where Jesus says something about because you believe, you are healed, or because you believe, you... Yeah, there, there's at least one instance where uh, 
Well, it was the woman who touched the hem of his garment. Your well, woman, your faith has made you whole. Um, it, and it's it's simply the faith, yeah. right? It's it's the act of reaching out, um, and that's a whole other ball of wax uh, that we could get into on, on on this. Now, yes, anyone else? This is a setup for the next verses because the technique we just used here is going to be very important in these next verses. So we're at verse 13 in chapter 4. <clears throat> now we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, so that you should not be grieved, just as also the rest of those not having hope are grieved, is, is the implication there. Stop for just a minute think about this. We're somewhere around the 70s AD, and there's been enough time passed that among those who were the early believers, the early followers of Jesus, some have died. And the, those in the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica are wondering, okay, we thought the Lord was coming back to take us all into his glorious kingdom, but our sister, brother, mother, father friend has died before Jesus got here again what about them now when so it's easy to read this like when I first read this passage again to study for this week I read this and thinking about well what about all those who died before Jesus ever got here that's not what he's addressing here that's a whole other question <laughs> uh, but that's not Paul's concern he seems to be addressing a question they've asked about those who who had believed, but have died. What's going to happen to them? And what he says is, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so that also, through God, those who have fallen asleep, through Jesus, Jesus will bring, God will bring Jesus to them. Uh, we declare this to you as the word of the Lord, that we are the, we who remain are living and will live under the coming of the Lord. And we shall not perceive those who have fallen asleep because the Lord himself with a loud command, imagine a, uh, a battle cry here, like from a commander, with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, like a call to battle, right, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, the living, who remain, together with them, will be, and here's the problem word, will be caught away, <laughs> sometimes translated snatched up, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so always, eternally, with the Lord we will be. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we talked a few weeks ago about left behind. We had a whole lesson, it was a few months ago, about left behind, and how I think it's a lie. And you're probably reading this and saying, well, wait a minute. This sounds a whole lot like left behind right here in the Bible. And if you have a great memory, you're remembering that I said the word rapture does not appear anywhere in the Bible, which is a true statement. Snatched up does appear. <laughs> but it's not the word rapture. And it's right here in this First Thessalonians passage. And what are we supposed to do with this? Especially after my rant against uh, Left Behind and its errant theology and all that. Uh, let's first think about the context to which Paul's writing. Remember again, um, he is speaking to early Christians who both he and they believe the Lord will return in their lifetime. This is Paul's earnest belief that Jesus will return, that, that this gap uh, and the kingdom of God will come fully while he's still living. But now they're 
gaining evidence that well, people are dying. What are we going to do about this? So um, it's been a long time since I've quoted extensively from our friend Tom Wright, uh, the British theologian. Uh, I've sort of let him rest for a while. But he's got a wonderful answer to this question that I, I want to walk us through. Um, the, the, uh, the subhead for this article is, Little did Paul know how his colorful metaphors for Jesus' second coming would be misunderstood two millennia later. And here's the point. Uh, I'm just going to read you a section of this because it's so good. Remember, he's writing from the other side of the pond, looking back on us. Remember that I told you that premillennial dispensationalism, the left behind theology, is a uniquely American view of things, right? Even though it has its roots in England, it didn't really take off there. It only took off on this side of the pond in a, in a subset of Christian, evangelical Christianity. Here's what Tom Wright says. The American obsession with the second coming of Jesus, off to a great start here, mm -hmm. especially with distorted interpretations of it, continues unabated. Seen from my side of the Atlantic, the phenomenal success of the Left Behind books appears puzzling, even bizarre. Thank you, Tom. Few in the UK hold the belief on which the popular series of novels is based that there will be a literal rapture in which believers will be snatched up to heaven, leaving empty cars crashing on freeways and kids coming home from school only to find their parents have been taken to be with Jesus while they've been left behind. Um, this pseudo-theological version of Home Alone has reportedly frightened many children into some kind of distorted faith. <laughs> Great writing here. Um, this dramatic end time scenario is based wrongly, he says, on Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. That's where we are today. Where he writes, and we've just seen this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are left alive will be snatched up with them on clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. What on earth? Or in heaven, did Paul mean, he asks. And then he goes on to explain, the scenario we read in 1 Thessalonians is Paul's words, not Jesus' words. It is Paul who should be credited with creating this scenario, he says. Jesus, as I've argued in various books, never predicted such an event. The gospel passages about the Son of Man coming on the clouds are about Jesus' vindication, his coming to heaven from earth. The parables about a returning king or master were originally about God returning to Jerusalem, not about Jesus returning to earth. Jesus seemed to believe was an event, this what Jesus seemed to believe was an event within time, space, history, not one that would end it forever. So he goes on to make the case that both the ascension of Jesus and the second coming are essential Christian doctrines, and we're not denying that that's important. But what Jesus teaches in the Gospels uh, is more sophisticated than this, uh, that builds on actual ancient biblical prophecy. Uh, and, and the idea is that all creation is overcoming its corruptibility, it's overcoming its mortality, and that Jesus will usher in this new world, not in the clouds, but here. That the new heaven and the new earth implies here. God, Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. Uh, George had a great sermon on this years ago that has stuck with me where he said, Jesus did not say, behold, I'm making all new things. I am making all things new. These are the words of Jesus. And we've got to interpret Paul through Jesus and not the other way around. Jesus is the Savior. Paul is not. So Paul is giving us metaphors here. He's speaking in metaphorical language to the church that some of them would understand, and he certainly is speaking from his Jewish heritage. 
he's echoing the story of Moses coming down the mountain with the Torah. The trumpet sounds, a loud voice is heard, and after a long wait, Moses comes to see what's been going on in his absence. By the way, it wasn't good. <laughs> then he's echoing the story of Daniel 7, in which it says the people of the saints of the Most High are vindicated over their pagan enemy by being raised up to sit with God in glory. And he's taking this and applying it to Christians who are suffering persecution, who will be lifted up out of their persecution and seated in a place of glory. And then he's got this image of an emperor visiting a colony or a province where the citizens go out to meet the emperor on the way, right? And they escort him into the city. Paul's image, Tom Wright says, of people meeting the Lord in the air should be read with the assumption that the people will immediately turn around and lead the Lord back to the newly remade world. Not that they're abandoning this world. Because the idea, the metaphor Paul's using here, it, again, is a people of a village or a province going out to meet a dignitary and then ushering that dignitary back in, not running away with the dignitary. That's not the way this metaphor works. Uh, there's sort of a mixed metaphor in this, he says, um, and, and the snatch language certainly makes it more difficult. Uh, how can we reuse, he asks, this biblical imagery to clarify the truth and not distort it. Uh, we might begin by asking, what view of the world is sustained, even legitimized, by the left-behind theology? How might it be confronted and subverted by genuinely biblical thinking? For a start, is not left-behind mentality enthralled to a dualistic view of reality that allows people to pollute God's world on the grounds that's all going to be destroyed soon? And this is indeed one of the results of uh, if you believe the earth is going to be destroyed, let's use up all the oil, let's use up all the water, let's use up all the air because God's coming and it doesn't matter. It's all set, right? Uh, but if we look at a broader view, Tom Wright says, and we understand that God is making all things new and that we're not getting away from here, but God is remaking a new heaven and a new earth uh, in a way that we can't understand, then we have a greater sense of stewardship about this. So can we see, again, one of our principles of biblical interpretation is take any one passage and you've got to read it in light of the whole of the Bible. And the whole of the Bible, particularly the whole of Jesus' witness, is, yes, Jesus is coming again. But Jesus is not coming to snatch us up in the air and Calgon be gone. You know, it's, it's, it's not that kind of thing. Uh, it is that Jesus is coming to make this the kingdom of God. That we will, we will be remade. Uh, all will be remade in a way that we can't comprehend. Question, is yep. it not, I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but is it not that we're taken up to be with him? He remakes the world, all things new. And we now are to inhabit the new. That's what Tom Wright world. says. Yeah, that, 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 that okay, it, he's using this imagery of being taken up. Um, and and I, again, I think it's a metaphor uh, more than a reality. But even, I, I, the farthest I would go, <laughs> and this is a really tacky metaphor that I'm, or example I'm going to use, um, uh, let, let's say that we've spilled cracker crumbs all over this rug back here, and we've got to we've got to remake the rug. We've got to clean it up. Well, you're gonna have to lift yourself up from it first, right? You're gonna have to be out of the way. <laughs> and I think the 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 most generous way to look at this in a that literal kind of way is to say, okay, if God's gonna remake the world, He's gonna lift us up out of the way. Uh, but my own view is that it's it's not even that. Uh, that whatever is going on is happening in a way in the space-time continuum that we can't understand because we, we can only think of this in linear time, right? To me, it sounds like Paul's presenting it, like you said, as people understand it. 
they had examples of people being lifted up right. to heaven without dying and the way they knew to announce things. So it was that they had to assume he'd come back like this. Well, because, G yeah, so Jesus had ascended. They saw, they not they, but the, the apostles and others, wow. several hundred others, saw Jesus ascend, which reinforces the idea that Jesus has gone up there somewhere, right? Uh, but keep in mind, uh, these are people who didn't have an understanding of cosmology the way we do, right? They, they didn't understand uh, the, the... The world was round. <laughs> That's a basic problem, yes, <laughs> right? What is the, do you know the reference on that? No, no, but I, I just remember quoting that scripture. I've heard it a lot because I always thought that heaven was up in the air. Well, so here's, here's the question I would ask you. If the earth is round and heaven is in the air, up, which up is it? Yeah, so uh, we're, 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 uh, Allison and I were sort of late to the game. We're watching this um, TV series that came out in 2019 that I, that I really, it's quirky. If you love the Coen brothers, uh, it's kind of got that feel. It's called Perpetual Grace. Um, and it's, I won't go into the whole thing, but there's this very naive kid in here who's been sheltered his whole life. And once upon a time, his father told him, when he was doing something, that he was going to go west, and west was left. Mm -hmm. And this kid, in his naivete, thinks left is always west is always left, because that's what his dad told him. Right. Well, in that moment, going west was left, but he he gets off a bus at some point when he's going somewhere, and he's someone tells him to go west, and he just turns left. And he ends up in the desert, lost, right? Because the directions don't apply there. And I think this is another way of thinking about this idea. If heaven is up, which up? And at which turn of the earth's axis, right? Um, now, you could argue, oh, well, heaven's everywhere outside of here. Um, I want to make the case that heaven is all around us. We just can't see it. Uh, I, I think uh, that we see a limited reality right now and that God is around us and the saints are around us and we just can't see it. Now, that's a little spooky. I get that. It's a little crowded. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand that part. Jim, were you going to say something? Oh, no, boy. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. So when they keep saying descend from heaven and meet in the air. Well, because that's what, the, that's what the ancients understood. I mean, that's the only way they could think about this, right? Uh, and it's metaphorical language. It is not literal language, right? Uh, it's, it's like saying, we're going to go up to Oklahoma. <laughs> right, because to us, Oklahoma's up. Caroline? The only thing is, if heaven is around us and the saints are around us, I, they must have like a Teflon coating because they could not be happy up in heaven seeing what's going on around us. Yeah, so Caroline says if the, if the saints are really around us, they, they've got to have a Teflon coating because they couldn't be happy with what they're seeing. <laughs> I don't understand how all that works, um, but um, it's an excellent point and one that makes... Boy, if you want to have, that'd be a great dinner conversation someday. <laughs> yeah, other comments on this? Well, your view makes more sense to me as we, as contemporary people, understand Christianity and what happens when you die. And, you know, I guess the most definitive statement I could think of is when you die, if you 
are Christian and are worthy of it, you spiritually somehow or other join God. And so who needs a rapture? Right. And the longer the longer we go <laughs> uh, away from, I mean, 2,000 years now, the more difficult that this concept becomes, right? R remember, Paul is writing to people who thought the Lord was going to return in their lifetime. And we've got to understand his view was limited. Yes, Paul wrote through divine inspiration, but Paul still also could not see that we would still be here 2,000 years later. We've got to comprehend that there were limits to Paul's knowledge, even though his words may be divinely inspired. Well, how often do you, you especially doing funerals, how often do you, at the graveside, do you hear the preacher sing, and George is right now in the presence of Jesus, he's meeting his Savior right now, you know, and yet... Well, and uh, Jim, I believe that's true. But... And I say that, and here's why. And so the question is, what, what if a pastor stands to the grave and says, well, you know, the, the deceased is now with the Lord? Uh, and I, I go back, again, my go-to on this, you've heard me say it 50 times, if you've been with this class long, is the old C.S. Lewis maxim of understanding that we see time in a linear fashion and God sees time happening all at once. It's not this way to God, it's this way to us, but eternity for God is now, right? Uh, eternity in God's eyes is now, all of eternity at the same time. Ellen says when people have brought up the rapture to her, uh, her mind thinks that maybe it all happens on an individual basis when we die. So the question is, does this rapture idea, does this... She thinks it does. Yeah, does it happen on an individual basis? Uh, and the reality is, we don't, we don't know, <laughs> because no one's ever come back to tell us, uh, you know, uh, so it's speculation at this point. But I think what, what Jesus seems to teach, so think about Jesus' words to the thief on the cross. He says, today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. And yet we also have Jesus teaching that the kingdom of God is coming right? Which is it? It's both. I think the answer is it's both. All right, Barry Early has the comment, all those people who have been in our lives, oh, it's going away, hold on a second, still live in our uh, memories, so good, so not so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is a little controversial. But okay. okay. Okay, so, yeah, back to my thought that, you know, heaven's around us. Is there like a membrane uh, that you can reach your hand through uh, kind of deal? Uh, so, yes, this is a really fascinating question. Um, I, I'm going to tell you only what I believe, and I can't quote a chapter or verse to this. But I, I, do, I do believe there are rare moments when there is some interaction between eternity and the present, between the world we can't see and the world we can see. Ann? Well, it makes me think of people who say that they have had out-of-body out of body experiences. Out of experiences. They're dead and then they're right. Dead. So there, there's just an, an interesting amount of evidence. Uh, some of it you would say is whack a -doodle. some of it's not, right? Uh, where, where people have had these interesting experiences, and I think many of us has ha have had moments where we almost feel the touch, right? Uh, now, is that just mental? Uh, you know, uh, are, 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 are we all just, you know, plugged into um, a circuit board somewhere? Uh, and having this mental experience that we think is reality, uh, <laughs> that's another option, uh, I guess. Um, okay, time. Yeah. Time. 
Yeah, time. Okay, uh, we're going to say a prayer uh, before we sign up for those who are here. Great discussion today, uh, by the way. Again, just a reminder, next week Jim Hancock is going to be teaching uh, for me. Well, uh, we haven't discussed that yet. Okay. If you could keep going to Thessalonians, that'd be great. Can we talk about heaven some more? <laughs> yeah, chapter 5 keeps it going. Yeah, chapter 5. Uh, maybe he can solve all this for y'all. Uh, you might not be here. If I come back the next Sunday and know that I'm left behind, I'll know I was wrong. <laughs> Very good. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, thank you for this great time together and for the challenge to think about things far beyond our understanding. We pray for your uh, grace to guide us in all ways. And we pray especially today for those who are struggling with various needs, physical needs, emotional needs, relational needs, that you would pour out your grace upon each one and bring kindness and healing and hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.